Good evening, everyone. It is Sunday, April the 19th, 2020. It is currently 5.52 p.m. Central Time, and this is our Sunday evening service. Yes, once again, being live streamed from Victory Baptist Church, an empty building. Well, not empty. I mean, I'm here, but other than me, it's empty. It's just me. Books everywhere, water bottles everywhere. Yes, I've been here. I don't know how many hours I've been here today. I feel like I've been here forever. Um, I was here. If you, all the hours I have been in this building since this pandemic has started and all of the restrictions were put in place, it has been pretty crazy. All of the hours of content that I have produced, but hopefully, Hopefully it has been beneficial. Now I've started a little early, so I don't know who who's tuning in, who's not tuning in. So let me give you a little bit of uh, you know information, things to check out. A couple of things I have been uh, playing, quote, quote unquote, reviewing a podcast on how to study the Bible. It's a podcast put put out. Basically, it's an evangelical podcast on how to study the Bible, and I have been playing each episode and then breaking in and giving my own commentary and adding to it and taking away and whatever. And the last two episodes, but well, the, the episode that I just reviewed a little while ago, I don't even know review, the, the, the episode I listened to live on the air and then gave comment on, I, I did so just a little while ago and concluded that episode was crazy because by the time I got to that done with that one, I was ready to throw my microphone across uh, Taylor County uh, because, wow, that one was frustrating. But that is all available. You can go listen to that on the Theology Central podcast. And this is very important. I'm um, My friend from Nebraska, Matt Capello uh, Jr., he uh, in our in our podcast, the VBC Bible Institute podcast, if you haven't subscribed to that, you really should, the VBC Bible Institute podcast, he did a seven-part series on the doctrine of the Trinity, and he's going to start doing these little 15-minute segments, I think around 15 minutes is what he wants to try to do, on um, how to study the Bible. So we're going to provide kind of a counterpoint to this how to study the Bible podcast that's been put out by, I don't know, Bible study tools. I don't know all the different ministries associated with that one. And you can you can hear my criticism become pretty, pretty strong um, in the last one that I reviewed. So we're going to definitely be doing that. So uh, and we're going to be doing another thing called a journey through the Bible. Um, and that's all going to be in the VBC Bible Institute. And hopefully that all comes to pass. I mean, that's the plan now. Plans can change. Uh, so we were doing our background method of Bible study for the VBC Bible Institute podcast, but once all of this happened and no one could be here, it felt weird trying to do the background method without people in the pew because it was your interaction that was really trying to make that, I think, more beneficial. Doing Bible study methods with people present, it's far easier to teach Bible study methods with people present So there, because they ask questions for clarification, or if you want to give an example, you can see if the example works or doesn't work. So check out the VBC Bible Institute. You can do that. For members of Victory Baptist Church in the Slack channel, I have the link to Five Minutes in Church History for Spreaker. So you can open that. It should open up your Spreaker app, and then you can just hit the little star and subscribe to Five Minutes in Church History on the Spreaker app. Because, well, like I said this morning, everyone should do that. All right. So this is what we'll do. We'll play a hymn and then we'll get started with tonight's. Well, once again, it's going to be time of catechesis. So get ready. Um, You won't need tonight. You will not need your uh, Westminster or Heidelberg or London Baptist Confession. You won't need that tonight. You'll see why in just a minute. Uh, Just have a notepad. You need to take some good notes tonight. All right. So here we go. Let's listen to this hymn, and then we will get started.
All right. Time for some catechesis. All right. Let's establish this to the best of my ability. All right. Let's try to get this all set up. If you have been, well, for those of Victory Baptist Church who listened this morning, and if you've been listening, we have been looking at five Latin words. We came to the Latin word sanctus, which means holy, and it also plays a part of the word sanctification. So I decided to take this idea, this opportunity, and again, we were dealing with these five Latin words by utilizing an episode of Five Minutes in Church History. You should subscribe to Five Minutes in Church History. There's a link to it in the Slack channel for members of Victory Baptist Church. Just tap on that. It should open up your Slack, uh, your Spreaker app, and then you can subscribe to it right there. So please do so. For those listening who do not have uh, the Spreaker app, and you're listening, well, if you're listening to me live, you do have the Spreaker app. If you hear this posted somewhere else and you want to listen to Five Minutes in Church History and you're not using the Spreaker app, Please, please, please uh, check all uh, your podcast app that you're using. Just do a search for Five Minutes in Church History. You should find it. I think it's on every podcast app on planet Earth and a couple of other planets as well. So subscribe to it. But we were using one of those episodes and in one of those episodes dealing with five Latin words, and we've reached the word sanctus, all right? Sanctus means holy. We took that. It's also part of sanctification. And so we started a long process of looking at the doctrine of sanctification and the uh Westminster Larger Catechism. We never really got to the Heidelberg. We were going to go to the London Baptist Confession of Faith, but I think we've got a pretty good idea of the doctrine of sanctification as outlined at least in one of the famous catechisms. Westminster uh, Confession of Faith is going to be very similar in its content and its argument, and we've kind of got a basic idea of the doctrine of sanctification. I'm not going to go back and review all of that, but let me make this very clear. We as Christians, believe, dogmatically we proclaim it as being truth, that we are justified by grace through faith because of Christ alone, 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 apart from works. We are not justified by our works. We are justified by the finished work of Jesus Christ. We the imputed Christ imputes his righteousness to our account. Therefore, we are declared to be perfectly righteous in the sight of God, not by anything we can do. We are justified by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone, period, end of story. And so we cannot come along and then start looking at the doctrine of sanctification and say or teach or do anything that goes, that basically contradicts or destroys our doctrine of justification. We would have to rewrite our doctrine of justification if we're trying to change it somehow to support a teaching or understanding about sanctification. So this is a big deal, and, and I've raised lots of questions about sanctification, lots of ways of understanding it. So here's what we're going to do tonight. I have an article in front of me where they attempt to to correct and identify 10 errors, 10 errors about sanctification, all right? In fact, the title of the article is 10 Errors to Avoid When Talking About Sanctification. 10 Errors to Avoid When Talking About Sanctification. Now, this... um, What we're going to do is we're going to we're going to look at the things they identify as errors, then it's going to be up to us to determine if we agree or disagree. Now, one of the things, one of the reasons I'm using this article is what they use to correct these errors are basically the Belgic Confession, uh, the Westminster Confession, uh, the Westminster Larger Catechism, Heidelberg Catechism. They're utilizing the same documents that we use to try to look at the doctrine of sanctification, all right? So that's why I'm using this because they u- are using the same documents to try to correct these errors. Now, what we have to remember, a couple of things. We don't believe the Westminster, Heidelberg, or any of those are infallible. So we're not bound to them. We use them as a guide to try to figure out, okay, here's how church history has handled this doctrine. But we're not bound by it. So let's keep that in mind. We're not restricted to it. We can question it. We can challenge it. We're ultimately bound by Scripture and Scripture alone. That's what we claim, right, is to, be, uh, to believe in sola scriptura. So, but we're going to look at these errors. We're going to look at the, how, what they identify, and we're going to look at what they have to say, and we'll see what kind of questions it leads us to. Again, there are, I just want to make sure I continue to just 
uh, man, I want to make sure everyone gets this. So much discussion about sanctification to, and, and, and my estimation and, and the minds of a lot of people, and, and this is a controversial thing within Christianity, a lot of it calls into question or attacks the doctrine of justification. If the doctrine of justification is the doctrine on which the church stands or falls, that's, that's, that was what many of the reformers proclaimed, that look, the doctrine of justification, that's what the church stands or falls on. You get that wrong, it's over, it's done, finished. So we cannot try to go to sanctification and try to come up with an idea or with something that ultimately destroys justification. That is my concern. And we have to really think about it. And, and, and why I think this happens is because we tend to study justification, right? Here's justification. And everybody says, amen, 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 amen. All right. We're done with the study of justification. Everybody good. All right. Now, Let's move and study sanctification. And we study them as two separate things. And I don't think people sometimes, I mean, look, we all know that people can forget what was preached three hours after it's preached. So I think a lot of people are are like, okay, here's what I'm supposed to believe about sanctification. And they never put the two next to each other to go, wait a minute. Are these agreeing or are they contradicting? Do these work together? Are they fighting each other? And and sometimes we don't see it. And, And remember, The Protestant mind is justification and sanctification are separate. Now, remember the uh, the Westminster larger was like they're inseparably they're they're linked together. They they are they are together in some ways. They're inseparable. So even though we don't want to merge them, we 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 they have to remain somewhat close to one another, and we've got to make sure we see how these two fit together. Uh, Either we destroy any separation and we make them one. Or we separate them so far that we are maintaining two contradictory ideas in our mind at the same time. And that's bad. That is bad. And I think a lot of people never, they talk about justification. You're like, amen, that sounds so good. We are in agreement. And then they start talking about justification. You're like, wait, I thought I was justified by faith alone, grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. And now you just made it sound like if I don't do these 37 things, I'm not saved. What, which which is it? Okay, so I, I think we need to think about it. So we'll see what errors they point out. I don't know how far we're going to go. I'm not, um, I would like to finish all 10, but we all know that that's not possible. So I'm just going to go. And when I think that if I go to the next one, I'm going to end up going too long, I'll just stop. I'm going to try. All right. Yeah, I know everybody's laughing. All right, here we go. Here is error number one. Now, these are not listed. I, I don't think they're listed in the uh, in any order of importance. They will make reference at times to the Heidelberg and to different confessions. I'm not going to sit here and look up each of their statements um, from this. We're just going to kind of just use this as its own source, and then uh, we'll talk about it. All right, here's error one. Are you ready? Here's error one they think that we need to avoid in regards to the doctrine of sanctification. Number one, and remember, this is their suggestion. We'll have to determine if we agree or disagree, all right? or at least this will give us some things to consider. Error number one that they say we should avoid. The good we do can in some small way make us right with God. Here is an error that we should avoid, and I think we can all agree with this is an error we need to avoid. The good we can do in some small way make us right with God. The good we can, the good we do can in some small way make us right with God. Now they make this very clear, and I think we'd agree this is a denial of the gospel itself. This is a denial of the gospel itself. All right. There is nothing we can do that can make us right with God. There is nothing we can do to make us right with God. Everyone just needs to write that down. There is nothing you can do. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing we can do. You, I, we, me, you. No one can do anything to make themselves right with God. We are incapable. We talked about this in our study of Romans 4. We we reviewed it again this morning. Think of Abraham and Sarah. They reached a point where there was literally nothing they could do to bring about the promises of God. There is nothing you and I can do to bring about the promises of salvation. We are disabled. We're incapable. Nothing we can do. There's no works we can perform to to do that. 
they go on to say this. This is a denial of the gospel. The good we do is of no use in our justification because even, listen, even the very best we do in this life is imperfect and stained with sin. We cannot do any work that is not defiled by our flesh and also worthy of punishment. I want you to, now this, I cannot, they may not draw the correlation here, but we have to draw the correlation. We have to write this down. So go ahead and write down that error. The error that we need to avoid is that the good, the good we do can in some small way make us right with God. That's the error that we need to write down. The good we can do, the good we do can in some small way make us right with God. That is an error. It is a denial of the gospel. It is false. It is to be avoided. And don't allow that to creep into your theology in any way, shape, or form. It is heresy. But this, I want you to write down. You can kind of skip a couple of lines and kind of write this and put this in in parentheses and kind of separate this. I want you to write down these statements, all right? Are you ready? Number one. The good we do is of no use in our justification because even the very best we do in this life is imperfect and stained with sin. You can just shorten it. Even the very best we do, even the very best you do in this life is imperfect and stained with sin. We talked about that this morning. We are going to advance that. Even the very best you can do is imperfect and stained with sin. Now, this is very important because if you say the way I know if someone is saved or the way I know I'm saved is I look at my good work and determine if I got enough good work to prove that I'm saved, I'm looking to the very thing that is imperfect and stained with sin to somehow find proof that I'm justified. This is at least a problem. For, for everyone, they have to at least consider it, that it's a problem. Now, remember, this doesn't mean, well, even the best I do is stained and imperfect. I should just do as bad as I can do. No, that's never the way we're supposed to think. Paul is going to contem- condemn that in the book of Romans. He's going to say, God forbid, that's not the right way to think. All we, But we have to acknowledge the reality of it. The very best, the very best you can do the very best, imperfect, stained with sin. All right? The very best. Now, you, so, so that means when you look at your best and you look at someone else and you look at all the messed up things they do, you just got to remember that your best is still imperfect and stained with sin. This, that truth should, should completely, that, that truth should be ever present whenever we talk about salvation, sanctification, uh, how you know you're saved, quote unquote test to prove you're saved. This reality has to come into play over and over and over again. The very best work that anyone can do is imperfect and tainted with sin. Now, there's the second thing I want you to write down. Again, put these in parentheses and kind of separate it from the main point. The error that we are to avoid is the good we do can in some small way make us right with God. That's a denial of the gospel. But I'm separating these statements because these statements, I think, transcend this error and they need to be ever present and all, and whenever we talk about these issues. So the, 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 very, the statement I wanted you to write down, even the very best we do in this life is imperfect and stained with sin. Number two, we cannot do any work that is not defiled by our flesh and is worthy of punishment. We cannot do any work that is not defiled by our flesh and worthy of punishment. There is no work we can do that is not defiled by our flesh and is worthy of punishment. So just think about it. You you say, well, look, I, I, I do this and this and this. This proves I'm saved. Well, you're looking to something that is defiled by the flesh and is worthy of punishment. That's that's an absolutely revolutionary thought, and I will say many Christians don't even truly believe it. We, our good is still polluted. Our good is still filthy rags. We, we, we pray. It's still tainted. We say, well, I'm praying. I'm praying for people. It's still tainted. You're serving people. It's still tainted. I'm loving people. It's still tainted. 
You go to church, it's still tainted. You read your Bible, it's still tainted. You, you try to be a good husband, still tainted. Try to be a good wife, still tainted. Try to be a good parent, still tainted. And you can look at all these things and say, see, this proves that I'm saved. Just please note, the evidence you are looking to to prove salvation is evidence that is tainted by the flesh, polluted by sin, and is worthy of punishment. No, I don't, We don't think that way. Those are radical statements. Those are radical statements. What, what many, what, this is the way we typically handle this. Yes, before, I'm a, before I became a Christian, everything is polluted and I deserve nothing but punishment. But after I'm saved, now God is working in me and now look at all these good works that I'm producing. Look at all these good works that are coming from my life. This proves that I'm saved. But if this understanding, doctrinal understanding is true, those good works are still tainted. So you're never truly free from sin, ever. You're never truly free from sin, never. So keep that in mind because when we get into Romans, there's gonna be passages that a lot of people teach and have used to teach the eradication of the old, of the old man, the eradication of the sinful nature. There, there are those who teach that. We've looked at some of those statements made by many. Well, wait a minute, I, then which is true? Now, if I can eradicate the old man and eradicate the sinful nature, well, one, that means I should possibly be able to live without sin. And two, then you could say these good works, they're not tainted by sin. They don't deserve punishment. But if you can't prove the eradication of the old man, then no matter what comes from our life is polluted. All right, let me read this entire paragraph again. The error number one, the good we can do in some small way makes us right with God. That's a denial of the gospel. It's false. The good we do is of no use in our justification because even the very best we do in this life is imperfect and stained with sin. We cannot do any work that is not defiled by our flesh and also worthy of punishment. Now, some will say, well, that's true of a lost person, but it's not true of a believer. Well, if it's not true of a believer, then, then how does this work? What, 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 what you say, well, the, 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 the work that God produces in your life, but it's still coming from my life. And there's still the remnant of sin that still impacts all of us. Remember, we talked about this morning that all of us, the, the remnant of sin is still in all parts of us. So there's no way that something's coming from us that's not tainted in some way, shape or form. Error number two. Error number two. We must be good Christians so that God will keep loving us. Error number two, this is the error that they they point out. We must be good Christians so that God will keep loving us. We got to think about this. We got to determine if we agree or disagree. They say the error is, let me read it again. The error is that we must be good Christians so that God will keep loving us. This makes God's love conditional. And we, t- we tend to teach, and I believe it's biblical, that God's love is unconditional, that he loves us. Now, now, he may love us and still can be angry, can still be upset, can still chastise, and, we, and chastisement is actually a demonstration of God's love. It's not a lack of it, it's a proof of. That's, I think, a biblical teaching. This is what they have to say about this error. So again, error number two, we must be good Christians so that God will keep loving us. This is what they say. To the contrary, the good news of justification by faith alone means that we can now do, that we can now do a thing out of love for God instead of only out of love for ourselves and fear of being condemned. In the midst of daily sins and weakness, the struggling Christian should flee to the refuge to Christ crucified. Um, Truths that it is not by their own merits or strength, but by God's undeserved mercy that they neither forfeit faith and grace nor remain in their downfalls to the end and are lost. So let me read this again. So uh, here's the error. We must be good Christians so that God will keep loving us. To the contrary, the good news of justification by faith alone means that we can now do a thing out of love for God instead of only out of love for ourselves and the fear of being condemned. 
In the midst of daily sins and weaknesses, the struggling Christian should flee for refuge to Christ crucified. Truths that it, that it is not by their own merits or strength, but by God's undeserved mercy that they neither forfeit faith and grace nor remain in their downfalls to the end and are loss. Let me try to clarify this. The error is we must be good Christians so that God will keep loving us. False. God loved us, <laughs> sent his son to die for us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were the enemies of God, Christ died for us. He demonstrated his love to sinners, to his enemies, to the unrighteous, to the one who deserved hell. That's how he saved us was by loving us while we are the enemy. Once we become his children, he obviously will continue to love us even when we fail, even when we sin. He is still there to forgive us. We have access to grace as we talked about this morning. No, um, we, uh, we, we don't, we don't strive to be good Christians so that God will love us. No, we strive to be good Christians because we love God and because he first loved us. We do so out of love. We do so out of gratitude, not out of, of, of fear of being lost or fear. It's We should do so out of uh, um, motivated by grace, motivated by love, motivated by a desire to please and to glorify. That should be it. Not to, oh, I've got to be a good Christian or God won't love me. No, he loved you before you even became a Christian. He demonstrated his love for you. It's an eternal love. Especially if we understand the doctrine of election, election he, he, he elected you before the foundations of the world. That's loving you before anything. All right, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less. Now, listen, doesn't mean you can't do something to make God displeased with you, to be angry with you, to bring chastisement upon you. That's different. As a parent, hopefully, there's nothing our child can do to stop us from loving them, that we will love them no matter what they do. But we may be disappointed. We may be angry. We may have to punish there may be consequences, but we love them regardless of what they do, right? That's, that's key. God does the same for us. He loves us. We, we, and, and I think this is important because sometimes, and, and I think sometimes this is in the mind of Christian kids, look what I've done. I can't go to God because they heard about God being holy, but they got to remember they are, you're justified by faith alone, God loves you, so we should flee to Christ. When, 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 because it, sometimes we fall into the trap of the world. The world is like, oh, you claim to be a Christian. Look what you did, you pathetic hypocrite. So you shouldn't go to God. No, you should run right to the cross, right to the church, right to the pew, right to the Bible. You should not run from it. You should run to it because you, we don't, we're, we, we're not trying to be good to get God's love. God's love is consistent. It is steady. It's never changing. So no matter what you've done, you run to God and you still will hear, I love you. But he, he now at the same time, he's going to tell you to repent. He's going to tell you to go and sin no more. But there's still going to be the love of God. There's still going to be grace. There's still going to be mercy. Yes, there may be chastisement, but no, sometimes we mess this up. And I, I think we mess it up without even trying. I don't think we, any, any pastor stands up there and go, hey, you better be a good Christian so that God will love you. I think it just kind of, the, the idea just kind of creeps into the mind of some Christians. And then when you mess up, well, forget this. I'm just going to quit Christianity. I'm just, I'm done. It didn't work out for me. No, you messed up. Come on in, come to the cross, come to Jesus, come, come to the throne of grace. If you're justified by faith, you have that grace available to you 24 seven. Don't run from. So this is an error that must be avoided. So what was error number one? I'm asking as if you can answer. The good we can do in some small way makes us right with God. False. That's a false gospel. Number two, we must be good Christians so that we, so that God will keep loving us. And that is, that, that's to the contrary. The good news of justification by faith alone means that we can now do a thing out of love for God instead of only out of love for ourselves and fear of being condemned. 
In the midst of daily sins and weaknesses, the struggling Christian should flee for refuge to Christ crucified. Truths that it is not by their own merits or strength, but by God's undeserved mercy that they neither forfeit faith and grace nor remain in their downfalls to the end and our loss. All right, no matter how bad you've messed up, there is supposed to be forgiveness. And I think sometimes Christians think, well, okay, you told me there's supposed to be forgiveness. However, we always do this. We, this is common language in the church. Well, you may be forgiven, but there's gonna be consequences. Well, who gives me the consequences? We do. We list the consequences. We determine the consequences and we hand out the consequences. Okay, well, yeah. And, and we, and that's, yeah, that's, we have to consider that carefully how what kind of idea we're giving all right error number three error number three if sanctification is a work of divine grace in our lives then it must not involve our effort now they labeled this as an error now this is error number three let me read it again if sanctification is a work of divine grace in our lives then it must not involve our effort. Now they're going to use West, they're using the Westminster, Belgic, they're using all the Reformed confessions, and they obviously don't believe sanctification is a monergistic work. They, they reject monergistic sanctification. They're clearly calling for a synergistic understanding. Let me read the error again that they are saying is an error. If sanctification is a work of divine grace in our lives, then it must not involve our effort. Not involving our effort is a monergistic view. God does it. You don't have to do anything. God's going to do it. And if you do do anything, God's doing it. So really, you're not doing anything, you know, however they tried to word, word it. But I mean, I've heard a lot of different explanations with the monergistic guy. Sometimes it sounds monergistic and then they start talking you're like that sounds synergistic. Like, no, it's not synergistic. It's monergistic. And you're like, OK, whatever. So you can get into a lot of little semantics here, fighting back and forth. They are arguing, no, our effort is involved in sanctification. Our effort is involved in sanctification. Now, we need, we need to talk about this, and we're going to read what they have to say here in a minute. I, I, I'm, I'm going to continue to stress this because I think there's a lot of truth to this. As a Christian, you're called to be holy. You're called to grow. You're called to grow in your knowledge. You're called to grow in grace. You're called to, to no longer be children, to, to be equipped, to become uh, mature. Uh, there's all these scriptures where you're called to do all of these things. And I... I still believe that one of the major contributing factors to Christians not doing these things is simply a lack of desire and a lack of effort and a lack of discipline. They don't want to. They claim they do, but they don't. And we, and this is where we have to be honest. I think it's an error to act like that sanctification is just going to happen without you doing anything, with you just sitting there. I, I, there's too much evidence to the contrary. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Um, and again, we've got too much evidence about sanctification that we talked about this morning. It's never going to be equal in all people. So clearly, why is there a difference? Are you saying God doesn't want some people to be sanctified and he wants some to be sanctified? Right? It's never going to be equal. It's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be equal. It's never going to be perfect. So clearly there, there's something going on. There, there's 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 a, synerg- a synergism at work here. There's There's... There's two, there's two things happening. You got God doing his work and then we come along and we play a part in this. Let's see how they describe it, all right? Let's see how they describe it. Error number three, um, if sanctification is a work of divine grace in our lives, then it must not involve our effort. Here's what they say. We are absolutely indebted to God for the good works we do. He is the one at work in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. At the same time, faith working through love leads a man to do by himself the works that God has commanded in his word. Our ability to do good works is not at all in ourselves, but still ought to be diligent. But we still ought to be diligent in stirring up the grace of God that is in us. All right, so faith working through love, love leads a man to do by himself the works that God has commanded in his word. 
So we're motivated by love. We are to stir up this grace. Yes, God, God's grace is at work in us. He's the one enabling us. He's the one strengthening us. But we have to stir that up. We have to rely on it. We have to do our part. Not for justification, for sanctification. There is a part we do. Look, no one's going to make you read your Bible. No one's going to make you memorize scripture. Thy word have hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Clearly telling you that the way to stop sin and reducing sin is memorizing God's word. No one's going to make you memorize it. No one. Not going to happen. Some Christians will. I will say the majority do not. Right? You need to, uh, as a newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So your growth spiritually is greatly determined by how much time, how much you partake of God's word as food. No one's going to make you do that. You know, if you're going to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, the way to resolve that is through the preaching and teaching of God's word. No, one, no one's going to make you listen to sermons today or tomorrow or next week. No one's going to make you subscribe to sir, to Christian podcasts and listen to sermons and think about sermons and meditate on theology. No one's going to do that. No one's going to uh, challenge you on, on all kinds of different things that are critical for your Christian life No, and, and, and doing good works. No one's going to force you to do that. You, are, you play a part in that. Now, yes, we, we hope and pray and believe that God is doing something in us. Scriptures seem to clearly indicate that. He's working, but then we're told to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. God is working in us, and what he works in us, we're supposed to, we're supposed to work out of us. We're part of that. Now, very important. That means, if, if, if say, uh, this goes back to, if I'm looking at this, if I'm looking at sanctification as somehow to prove my justification, you see how in how imperfect this is going to be as being, uh, you know, the way to find out if I'm saved. You're never going to know because you're involved in this process. You're involved in the entire sanctification process. Right? Number four. So let's review these. Number one, the good we can do in some small way makes us right with God. That's a denial of the gospel. It's false. All right. The good we can do in some small way makes us right with God. That's false. Number two. We must be good Christians so that God will keep loving us. That is false. God's love is consistent. It is eternal. It is unchanging. It is perfect. That's the way we love. I love you. If you, if you know, you better do good for me to continue to love you. If you don't, I'll stop loving you. That's man's love. That's not God's love. Man's love is conditional. God's love is unconditional. Error number three. If sanctification is a work of divine grace in our lives, then it must not involve our effort. That is false. Our effort is involved. Error number four. Now, this is very important. Error number four. Warning people of judgment is law and has no part to play in preaching the gospel. Error number four. Warning people of judgment is law and has no part to play in preaching the gospel. Now, this gets into this whole discussion about law and gospel. When should we preach law? Or or we don't preach law. We don't warn people because that's law. Or, or, now, this is very a Lutheran concept. Whenever you preach law, you say, hey, this is what the Bible says you're supposed to do, but you can't do it. Don't worry about it. God, uh, Christ took, took care of it for you. And so you never really warn anybody about judgment or about anything like that or about law. That is... I think what they're getting ready to do is not completely address that issue, but at least refer to it. All right, so let's consider it. Warning people of judgment is law and has no part to play in preaching the gospel. Actually, preaching the gospel should both open and close the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is open by proclaiming to believers what God has done for us in Christ. The kingdom of heaven is closed by proclaiming to unbelievers and hypocrites that as long as they do not repent, the anger of God and eternal condemnation rest on them. God's judgment, both in this life and in the life to come, is based on this gospel testimony. All right. Warning people of judgment is law and has no part in, uh, to play in preaching the gospel. All right. So they're not really focusing on this preaching law necessarily to a believer. We will have to talk about that. Um, 
we could go back to the uh, Westminster Larger Catechism on this in the Heidelberg because they talk about the purposes of the law even for an unbeliever. But um, so, yes, there there is this mindset that, hey, we don't need to preach the law, but we do. We continue to preach the law. They talk about this opening and closing uh, of of the kingdom of heaven. This is kind of getting into the keys of the kingdom concept and what those keys are and who uses them and how they're utilized. They're saying it's kind of utilized here in the proclamation of the gospel. When we preach law to an unbeliever, we're closing off heaven to them and showing that you're a sinner, you are condemned, therefore heaven is closed to you. And when we proclaim uh, the gospel to those who believe, then heaven is opened because they find out what Christ did for them and that they are saved. And yes, the proclamation of the gospel to a sinner, to anyone, you need law and gospel. Both needs to be proclaimed. Uh, people have got to hear the law to, to know that they are condemned and then hear what Christ did so that they will flee to Christ and, he, and be saved and trust in his finished work because the law will prove to them that they will never be able to save themselves. So it is an error to say that the law should not be preached. Um, it should be. And they said, warning people of judgment is law and has no part to play in preaching the gospel. That is not true. That you do, I will argue you're not preaching the gospel unless you preach the law. Because the law is what drives people to Christ. So I think the preaching of the, the law is instrumental to preaching of the gospel. I mean, you need both. In modern Christianity, you just want to preach the gospel, but you preach the gospel not so much of Jesus saving you from sin and the power of sin and the penalty of sin. You preach Jesus as being the Savior to save you from your you know, depression and not having a friend and not having a purpose in your life, and which is flawed. All right, there's error number four. Error number five. There is only one reason Christians should pursue sanctification, and that's because of our justification. All right, now this... This is interesting one. We got to really put our thinking caps on this. There is only one reason Christians should pursue sanctification, and that's because of our justification. They say this is an error. All right, let me read it again. There's only one reason Christians should pursue sanctification. That's because of our justification. So they're saying it's an error to say, look, the reason you should pursue sanctification is because of your justification. If you're justified, you will pursue sanctification. That's the only reason you should do it. They say that's an error. Well, let's see what they say here. The Heidelberg Catechism lists several reasons, motivations even, for doing good. We do good because Christ by his spirit is also renewing us to be like himself, so that in all our living we may show that we are thankful to God for all he has done for us, and so that he may be praised through us, and we do good works so that we may be assured of our faith by its fruits, uh uh-oh, and so that by our godly living, our neighbors may be won over to Christ. All right, we've got a lot to work through here. All right, we're, I'm going to try. We're not going to go any further than this one. We'll stop right here if we can try to work this through. All right. Oh boy. All right. Here's where you have these two concepts you've got justification, you've got sanctification. And some seem to say the reason you should pursue sanctification is because of justification. Justification alone. You're justified. You should pursue sanctification because you are justified. They say the Heidelberg Catechism offers several reasons you should pursue sanctification. So therefore, the only reason is not just your justification. They say the the reasons are as follows. Here they are. Number one, we do good because Christ by his spirit is also renewing us to be like himself. All right? So we have the spirit renewing in us to be like himself. That There's there's something happening inside of us is why we should pursue it. Uh, So that in all our living, we may show that we are thankful to God for all that he's done for us. So, So another reason we should pursue sanctification is to show that we are thankful. We should do it because uh, God, because Christ by his spirit is renewing us to be like himself. So we should do it because something is happening in us. Number two, we should do it to show that we are thankful, right? Um, Number three, so that he may be praised through us. We should pursue sanctification so that God can be praised. Number four, and here's the big one. We should do this 
so that we may be assured of our faith by its fruits. Here's back to that assurance concept. We, we ended Sunday school talking about this, all right? So we're, we're building. One concept is building on another. I know this is very technical, but it, this is catechesis. We're digging in. We're going deep here, all right? This is important. This is where I begin to have my problems. Hey, you better pursue sanctification. Why? Because your sanctification is going to assure you of your faith by its fruits. In other words, your sanctification is going to provide fruit of, of your faith. And then you can have assurance. So where am I looking? So look at, look at this, this look, at, look at how, oh, this bothers me. Look at how this, this plays itself out. All right, so I'm talking to a Christian. Here's a new Christian. They're sitting here next to me. All right, um, why, why should I pursue godliness? Why should I pursue holiness? Why should I do these things, okay? Well, I give all those reasons we've already talked about, but then I get to this one. Well, do you want to be assured that you're saved? Yeah, I want assurance. Well, if you want assurance of your faith, you got to look to the fruits and your sanctification is going to be that fruit that you look to. So for me to be assured of my, of my justification, I need to look to my sanctification? Yeah. That's where, I, that's where I'm like, the, that's where the wheels come off for me. Look at everything that we've discussed about sanctification. It's not perfect. It's not going to be the same. Everything, all your good works is polluted by sin. They deserve judgment, but I'm looking to this somehow to prove my justification. What should I be looking to to prove my justification? I can, I know it sounds like a broken record, but, uh, but this is so critical to this. I, I should be pointing people. How do I know I'm saved? Because of what Christ did. His finished work. How am I saved? Imputed righteousness. Look, if I have the imputed righteousness of Christ, then what I look to for my salvation is that righteousness, which is summed up by the perfect and passive obedience of Jesus Christ. That's the fruit I'm looking for, the fruit of the good works of Christ. His good work. He kept the law. He died for sinners. He, 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 he was obedient even unto death. He was perfect. He was without sin. I'm looking to him. I'm looking to that perfect righteousness. But they're like, no, part of the reasons you should do this, let me read it to you again. Part of the reasons you should do this is to be assured of your faith by its fruits. That you may be assured of your faith by its fruits. Now, this is where we get that whole idea. Fruit inspector. This is where we get that whole idea. How do you know them? You know them by their fruits. Well, you know false teachers by their fruits. And I think that context there has a lot to do with false teachers. It comes from the Gospel of Matthew. And remember, you got those in Matthew, is it Matthew 7, I believe, where, hey, Lord, we did all these wonderful works. We proclaimed, we prophesied, we cast out demons. Um, Depart from me, I never knew you. Whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. I have assurance. Look at all these good works. Doesn't work. Well, there, there's got to be something wrong with their faith. This, this is where I, this is where I struggle greatly here. I, again, I understand there's text in scripture that seems to say, if you're a Christian, you will do this. I understand that. If you, if you are a child of God, you will do this. I'm not denying that those texts are there. I'm just saying that if I look to those tests, I, I've said it again. Everyone claims first John is the test book. Now I, I, I was, uh, I've seen many things written by pastors and theologians who challenge that interpretation, but some say, how can I know that I'm saved? Go to 1 John. Well, if you're honest, if you go to 1 John and you look at all of those tests, you're honest with those tests. You take them as literal tests to prove salvation, not to prove fellowship, but to prove salvation. Then guess what? You're gonna, if you're honest with yourself, you're going to be like, mm, don't do that one all the way. Don't do that one all the way. So then this is what people say. Well, no, you take the test, but you're not looking for perfection. You're looking for what? This becomes a problem. So here's what we would say with this one. And we'll have to stop right here. I'm going to stop right here. Error five is there's only one reason Christians should pursue sanctification, and that's because of our justification. I say that's an error. I will say there are more than one reason a Christian should pursue sanctification. There is more than one reason a Christian should pursue sanctification. And I think some of those reasons is um, out of gratitude 
out of love for God, out of desire to glorify God, out of desire that he can be praised, out of, out of, out of a desire to be a good testimony to those in the world. I think there are a lot of reasons. I think it is questionable and I think it's dangerous to say you should do so to prove that you're saved. If you want assurance, you've got to do you've got to be pursuing sanctification because that fruit is going to give you the proof that you are saved. That becomes very damaging to the doctrine of justification. Because I mean, look look what you're saying. How do I know I'm saved? Well, show me your works. Show me your works. So, my works are going to prove that I'm saved before God? I thought what's going to prove that I'm saved before God is the work of Christ imputed to my account. You see, it's almost like we're saying two contradictory things. And and trust me, if this was super easy, if this was super easy, there wouldn't be 2,000 years of argument over it in church history. Everyone who thinks they've got it all figured out, well, congratulations. I'm glad you do because no, in, in church history, there's been nothing but arguing and fighting over this for 2,000 years. They're still arguing and fighting over it. There's arguing and fighting with what, uh, with things Piper have said about justification. There's arguing and fighting with things uh, MacArthur have said in regards to lordship salvation and his test. Jonathan Edwards had his test to know if you're saved. There's there's the what's called easy believism or some call it free grace movement. There's all these different movements dealing with justification and sanctification throughout the body of Christ. You and and you you these fights are never going to end because this is not there's no easy answer. There are passages of scripture that seems to say, if you don't do A, B, C, and D, you're not saved. Well, what do I do with that? Well, if I say that's true, then I seem to be attacking the doctrine of justification. Now, what Christians do is say, ah, no, no problem, no conflict, and just try to reconcile it some way by a little clever, uh, a, a little clever slogan like, well, you know, we're saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves doesn't remain alone. Woo, problem solved. Well, okay, the problem is you just now said that if I don't have this, 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 and this, then I'm not saved, which means works are required for me to be saved. Well, no, 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 works aren't required. If I don't do the works, then I'm not saved. Well, because they're a product of salvation. So you just get into this never-ending circle. And this is what confuses, if you listen to sometimes Catholics talk, Catholics are like, I don't know what you Protestants think. On one hand, you want to say you're saved by grace alone through faith alone, and the next minute you sound like you're Catholics saying that if you do A, B, C, D, and E, you're not going to get to heaven or that you're not going to heaven. Now, at least we give you the chance in purgatory. Sometimes the the Catholics are, are more confused by our explanation. They're like, okay, so justification is an instantaneous act. Just uh, Justification is an instantaneous act where you're declared righteous. Sanctification is a process, but if you don't finish that process, with enough good works, then you're never saved. So then the only way you'll ever know you're saved is by the end of the process. Well, doesn't that make that a part of justification then? Didn't you just make sanctification a part of justification? I want you to hear what I just said. If you say the way you know you're saved is through process of just, of, of sanctification, that the fruit being produced in sanctification proves it, Well, the only way you're ever going to know that you're saved is you've got to allow that process of sanctification to end. It's got to conclude. And then you can look back and go, whoop, yep, I did it. See, my sanctification proved it. But you can never know for sure until the process is over because you can be having a very good weekend being, look at my fruit. Woohoo! Man, look at my sanctification. I'm proven I'm justified. Look at me. And then all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute. Now that I'm re-looking at all of this, it's all tainted by sin. I'm I'm a sinner. I keep, oh, I don't know. Now I'm not so sure. Okay, well, maybe I need to wait. It, you'll never have assurance. You'll never have assurance. And guess what you're doing? Now you've placed justification, the assurance of justification as being a part of a process that you don't know until you get to the end. <laughs> you've now merged justification and sanctification as a process, you can say, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. That, that's what happens with this. And we, we saw this, and I'm not going to go back. You can go back and listen to the podcast. I played, uh, you know, sermons where they give you the test. Look at any sermon series on 1 John, and there'll be, here's the test of true faith. 
here's the test. Here's the test. Here's the, and then when it's over, I guess everyone in every church believes they passed the test. Yeah, whatever. When we're just told that all, even our good works are tainted with sin. And they're imperfect. And they deserve punishment. <laughs> yeah, no. I believe, this is what I'm going to say. I believe sanctification. The motiv- motivation for sanctification, there are many. Love for God. We want, we want God to be glorified. We want other people to see uh, the good works so that they will praise God, uh, to be a testimony. I think all of that is true. As far as how our good works uh, apply to the um, assurance of faith or proof of salvation, that one I put a question mark on. And I don't know. And, and, and the reason I'm going to put a question mark on it is because clearly, if it was an easy answer, someone in 2000 years of church history would come up with an answer that would get some kind of an agreement. But no, there's so much division on this. There's division between the Catholic and the Protestant. There's division within the Protestant from Protestant to Protestant. There's division uh, within even sometimes the same movement of Christianity, the same theological brand. They can't even agree on it. And I think sometimes when you think you have an agreement on justification, once people start talking about sanctification, sometimes you don't even know if you have an actual agreement on justification. This is a major problem within Christendom, and that's why we are taking the time to figure this out. So what we can agree on is that, hey, your 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 motivation, the reason you should pursue sanctification is not just because of justification. It is because of a number of other things your love for God, you, you, you are, you, your gratitude, you want God to be praised, you want God to be glorified, you want other people to see your good works as a good testimony so that they will glorify God. There are a lot of reasons how it plays, how sanctification plays into my justification as proof or as, as something to give me assurance that I don't think there can be any certainty given in any way, shape, or form. I don't think there can be because, again, if I go through First John, I'm not going to be assured of anything. All right, I'll stop right there. That's a lot of information. We made it through five. We got five to go, and we'll see what they have to say. Um, again, I would challenge you, uh, open up the Westminster, uh, Westminster Larger Catechism, the Westminster Confession of Faith, the London Baptist Confession of Faith, and read everything they have to say in regards to sanctification. Struggle through it. Struggle through it. Work through it. Get it. You you may read it 15 times and on the 16th time go, wait a minute. Okay. This is saying this. Read read what they say about justification and read what about what they say about sanctification. We did that with the London Baptist Confession of Faith. And there were people in the church who acknowledged, well, wait a minute. That seems to be contradicting what they just said about justification. And I was like, amen. I think it almost appears at times to be a contradiction because they're trying to work out these, look, for in church history, the two were almost merged. And then we come along and try to separate the two. And then we separate the two. And then at times we try to merge them back together. It's this weird struggle with these concepts. And so read, read all of it, read all of it over and over and over and over and over until these problems become your problems. If they don't become your problems, then you don't care enough to figure it out. There are problems here. They're, they're not easily fixed. And if they were easily fixed, I'm telling you, there would be more agreement than there is on this subject. All right, we'll stop right there. That concludes our Sunday of live broadcast podcast. I'm done. My voice is shut. I give up. Okay, I'm finished. Uh, I hope I've accomplished something today. I know I've put forth a lot of work. I hopefully I've accomplished something. So thank you for tuning in. Let the emails let the emails fly. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. Members of Victory Baptist Church, feel free to throw in your comments. Um, hopefully you agree. If you disagree, I, I, I may not have much strength tonight to, to, to argue with you. This may be the time to disagree. I'll just say you're right. Okay. So, all right. I'll stop there. Good night. Everyone have a great week. God bless.